Let's see. Yeah, I forgot. All right. So we we discussing peer review. Uh, and let me see. There is a chat comment. Yeah. So the um. We will do both, both days. So we will do both Tuesday and Thursday uh, live, like in, on campus in A255. So uh, we will see how it goes. So if next week, you know, is a success, then we will continue. Uh, if I'm alone there or just a just few people, then maybe we will go back to the online version. So we will, we will start next week with the live sessions in a physical, uh, on, on campus physically in A255. And we will see how it goes. Uh, and then we will see. I, I haven't checked with Carl uh, because next week uh, it's my class. And then you will have some lectures given by Carl. And I'm not sure if he will run them physically or if he will run them um, uh, digitally. So um, let me quickly do the lectures um, schedule. So we have, um, yeah, so next week uh, it will be physically in 255, both, both sessions. Uh, yeah, actually, I didn't check with, with Carl yet. Yeah, that's a good point. So I thought I have both days next week, but I don't. So I will tell you on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, we definitely having physical session. And then on Thursday, I, I will check with Carl. So everywhere where it says Carl, that's um, um, Carl will run the session. I will be there, but he is the main uh, main person. Uh, so it, it's a little bit up to him. I'm not sure if he uh, can run it physically or not. He's working, so he um, you know he has a, he has a full time job. Uh, he's our graduate, so he graduated from our program before, and uh, he's an excellent programmer and, and a really good uh, lecturer as well. He, he gives kind of a good uh, good content, but I'm not sure if he can do it physically. So if he cannot, his sessions will be online and then we can stick to my sessions being on campus. So yeah, good good question, thanks. I will, I will double check that. Okay, so uh, regarding the, the peer review. Um, so the, the purpose of peer review is that um, you get feedback, right? So of course, uh, that's that's the that's the main point. But what does it mean? Well, it means that you get perspectives from multiple angles, right? So if I tell you that you did something well or something wrong, it's just one per particular perspective. And I'm not representative of all the programmers and all the people who are gonna read your code and follow, you know, uh, work with you or do things such that. I, I don't feel you know um, authoritative enough to tell you that you're doing something's wrong or something's good. It's a little bit of a, a social phenomenon that we need to kind of explore and we're doing it by um, by discussing like uh, and by doing the peer review, right? So um, it's all about feedback, but it's all about kind of ideas as well. So I have certain ideas and I have certain things to, to point out, but others might pay attention to other things. So some, sometimes the code may be readable to me and I'm, I'm like fine with the particular structure of the, of the way of thinking, uh, but other people might not. And they give you their own feedback, right? So it, it's all about feedback, but it's kind of uh, a little bit about the ideas, a little bit about the perspectives. Um, and it's more, more like a discussion, right? It's not that there is a, a wrong or a correct way of, of doing things. There are basically better or worse ways of doing things. Uh, and some people pay attention to different things. So um, ideas, perspectives, uh, ways of thinking, um, what else? Um, priorities. So for some people, for example, comments and code are not important. And for other people, it's super important, like this literate kind of way of uh, discussing the code, communicating through the code. Uh, for some people, the structure of the program, like in stack or whatever that is, is very natural. For some others, you need to have a bit of a description in readme file. So, you know, just put something in, right? Um, be, um, 
uh, highlighting priorities, let's say. So different people have different priorities. Highlighting priorities. Highlight. Uh, come on. Highlighting priorities, yes. Light. Light. Yeah. All right. So, um, what else? Um, so, I like. I want you to do it for yourself, right? So, if you don't do it, that means you sort of are free riding on other people giving you feedback, but you don't give anything back. So it's sort of like a prisoner's dilemma. You can try that, and then you can kind of benefit from, uh, you know, the social group giving you feedback, but you're not paying anything back. But you should pay back, right? And the more you pay back, then potentially others will do that and the more feedback you're going to get. So we're going to have more um, positive discussion, right? So um, the mechanics is like, you know, um, the more you, you put in, the more you're probably going to get back. Uh, so, so put stuff in. Um, so mechanics. So put as much in as you can. Um, then you hopefully will go get back good value as well. Um, B, like we want uh, the feedback to be constructive, um, but don't fear, fear that you can uh, do something wrong, that you can point to things that you should not point to, right? So there are two um, sections which are free text. Uh, one is like uh, what positive things are there and what negative things are there. Uh, don't be afraid to put stuff in, uh, you know, be constructive, uh, be gentle, uh, don't, um, you know, don't make kind of um, gentle, uh, don't, um, don't use kind of a negative language or personal language, um, kind of focus, focus on code or not necessarily code, but like on tech, right, not on person. So it, it should be not personal. Uh, it should be about solving a, a solution or expressing yourself, but it should be about the tech. Um, and then don't be afraid to put stuff in uh, because that, that's what you want. Like if, if you're reading some, some feedback about your own uh, task, that's the thing that you want. You want somebody to show you what you, know, you didn't pay attention to and you could have, right? Um, so there is no wrong and, and right. Uh, no real wrong or right, right? Uh, we are not here, you know, dogmatic religious re leaders to say, yeah, you have to follow this particular thing. Uh, it's, it's an evolving space. It's a way of us approaching particular problem domain. Uh, so, you know, it's all about thinking. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with one way of thinking or the other, like one way of thinking might be um, less limiting, maybe more abstract, but then maybe it's a bit harder. Maybe it's a more wordy way of, of expressing something. And then the other one is simpler, maybe a bit more dumb, but maybe shorter. And you know, you always have trade-offs, always have benefits, right? So this kind of a variety of trade-offs is kind of a purpose as well. So, oh crap, what did I press? Good that I didn't delete it. <laughs> right. So um, the thing is, you know, don't don't be afraid to, to do it wrong. And it's kind of a mutual discussion. So if if you go overboard with something, then the you know others will kind of correct it. So you you know it's all balancing, right? Uh, we're trying to reach some uh, some form of consensus. Oh come on, work. What's wrong with my browser? to refresh it. Yeah, GitLab is slow. Some some things are happening, I guess. All right, so there is a question. Uh, so Susan says that she did some reviews. Um, okay, so she couldn't, I will test it. Yeah, thanks for the comment. So she tried to put some uh, feedback in and she was not able to, so I will check um i will check in the in the system if there are some glitch so the the system as christopher was explaining to you is kind of built by students it's maintained by us a little bit but and some other master students 
and it's not perfect. So there are some glitches. So every time you see some glitch, uh, put, put it into my or his course issue tracker and we will kind of follow up. So I will, I will do that. Um, so what, uh, what I was at here, um, trade-offs. Yeah. So various trade-offs and the, again, you know, the, the focus is that it's always plural, right? So there are different, different plural things um that i am not able to capture all of them i have my own bias i have my own you know a particular way of looking at, at things and then uh i'm not always right uh, there might be better ways of doing things and then i will learn from you as well right so um be open right so put as much as you can be constructive be gentle uh focus on the tech not person there is um uh, there's no real wrong or right uh, feedback. Um, just, you know, different priorities, for example, right? For some people, certain things are higher priority than for you. And they may say, oh, yeah, you should do this. And you say, yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, but maybe that was not on my priority list. Um, but maybe it should, right? So it depends. Uh, we're not coding for ourselves. We're coding for either the customers for the people who are using the software or for other developers to communicate with them. So you're not kind of alone here. Um, all right, so if you think of something, you can add it here as well uh, on this wiki page. And I kind of encourage you to, uh, to do the reviews. I don't remember when the reviews will shut down, uh, but I will extend probably by a few days such that you all can put some stuff in uh, and it's relatively fast. You just open the form and you just click a couple of uh, checkboxes and you fill in some, some text fields and you're done. So uh, do that because once you receive feedback yourself, you will kind of really be, you, you will be grateful that that, you know, that that happens. So you will learn, learn from it. Okay, so do that, please. Um, I will, yeah, so I have to check those two things. I have to check the Thursday with Car. Um, and I have to check the feedback, the peer review feedback forms. Okay, um, any other logistic issues? I don't think any questions so far. All right, so what we will do today, uh, we do some coding, uh, but because I, I am a little bit slow, so, and also the time passes quickly, I, I pre-coded some things already. So I will, um, yeah, let, let me move that out. Let me open those two things. And you will notice that I have some Golang code and I have some uh, Haskell code. So what we will do today is let's go to, let's go to Haskell first because I have my readme file. Okay, so we will spend a little bit of time discussing error handling and validations. So error handling is something that we will spend a little bit more time later in the course once we learn um, Rust because Rust has a quite nice um, way of dealing with different severity of errors. Um, but here we just have a, a basic um, you know, understanding of, of what we are discussing. So um, we have a certain Object, uh, objectives for our program, right? So we want a program to behave in a certain way. Uh, and then there are possible um, enforcements uh, to, to deal with the exceptional situations or things that can kind of go wrong, right? So normally um, in software, there are, you know, um, external errors, which are kind of, out of our control. For example, we want to open a file and then you know, the permissions are not set on a particular directory and it, it needs to be handled externally to the program itself, right? So the user or the administrator needs to set something up external to the program to kind of fix those errors. Um, we could have user errors, which means um, we expecting user to do something and then user does it wrong, right? So they provide us uh, invalid input or they click the wrong sequence of commands or buttons, Some, something went wrong and it's the, the user problem. Um, and then you have sort of internal um, 
internal problems that are not external to the program, but they are internal to the program. And they may usually occur because certain contracts are violated. So maybe you're using a library and maybe you using the library wrong, like, um, you know, you're not supposed to pass certain things and then you, your program did and then things kind of, you know, go sideways or you have some bugs in your program, like one of your functions violates the contract of another function. So we always, when we program, we have certain um, prerequisites for the API that should not be violated. And that kind of guarantees that the program will behave the way we predict. And then if those guarantees, those uh, preconditions are violated, then usually what happens is you, uh, end up in a state that was not planned. Um, and then the state might be really damaging, like it may cause kind of a cascade of, of problems, or it can go unnoticed for, you know, some time. And you have those kind of a different types of errors uh, or bugs. So if, if you have those internal bugs and they are, for example, to do with concurrency or something to do with um, things that kind of linger in the production and the deployed system for long and then occasionally show up, those are really hard to, to find out and to, to debug. Um, often if we program and we have some assertions, uh, then they, they kind of catch our mistakes early and then those can be uh, kind of um, fixed, you know, uh, fast. So we have uh, those, broadly speaking, three categories of, of, of errors. And today we're going to deal with the, with the first one, right? So we're going to discuss, okay, what to do when the user do something wrong, right? Um, so of course, first rule is your program should never crash, right? Um, so if your program misbehaves or crashes because of the user interaction, then you did something wrong. It's, it's your problem. It's your big mistake. It could be a security vulnerability. It could be, um, you know, data consistency. It can lead to, to, cut, to cut a cascade of serious issues, but it's always your problem. Um, so your programs always should be robust enough such that user input or, uh, you know, input to the program never really crashes the program or makes the program misbehave, right? You should kind of count that in. That should not be possible, that um, user errors kind of uh, crash your program. Well, that's ideal situation, of course. Uh, a lot of times that's not true. And uh, in fact, most of the software can be exploited by something from, from a user, right? Uh, so for example, in the security course uh, with Basel, they take uh, software which generates random inputs. So for example, you can have, uh, th this technique is called fuzzing. So for example, you can take a fuzzing program that generates um, different, very obscure PDFs. And then you can test it on Adobe Suite and check when the Adobe Suite will crash given a particular PDF document, right? And then you can kind of exploit it. So you brute forcing kind of a random PDFs uh, you know, millions and millions of PDFs, you, you, you're pushing it through some uh, Adobe uh, processor, which takes PDF as input, and you wait for when it crashes or when something uh, happens, and then you exploit it, right, for whatever you want, like for crashing a system, for denial of service, for escalating uh, permissions, whatever, right? Uh, that should never happen. Like, you know, a PDF should never crash a PDF processor. The PDF processor should say, ah, oh, you know, something is kind of wrong with my input and it should weed it out, but it's easier said than done. It's not as easy to do. Um, anyway, so um, we are focusing on the user errors and we have basically three methods of dealing with it. So the, the simplest method is that we kind of need to detect that something is out of ordinary and we need to, we, we don't care like what it is, we just detected it and we sort of ignore it. Like we incorporated in our program in such a way that, um, you know, um, we, let's say we asking a user for age and then a user gives us string, which is not a number. We kind of ask the user for age again, right? We don't care. Like we don't tell the user what the problem was. 
Uh, we don't do anything with the problematic input. We just repeat and ask for a correct input again, right? So that's the simplest, simplest mechanism is we don't really care what was the source of the error, what was the error type or what was really problematic. We just need to detect it. And then we just kind of ignore it and go on with our life or with the program. So if we need age from the user, we ask again, we do the pop-up again, right? Um, yeah, that's the simplest. Um, usually that's the easiest, uh, but it has kind of a, a, a small problem that, you know, the user may not know what was what went wrong, right? So if that was a user input or, you know, problem with the input, uh, and we just ask for it again, the user may give us the same thing again, and that's wrong, right? We're asking for a date, and the user gave it in the wrong, like, American order, year, uh, day, month, or something, I don't know. Uh, then we ask again, and again, it's in the wrong format, right? Uh, so maybe we need to do the second way, right? So the second way is um, we check what is the error, but if we have a sequence of instructions, uh, we don't care about subsequent errors if the first one prevents the processing, right? So we're asking a user for a date, and the date is in a wrong format, and it's in the wrong range, right? So we, once we detected that in the wrong format, we don't care that it's in the wrong range as well. We just say, look, uh, the format needs to be this, and then the user fixes that. Uh, but then uh, the second problem is that the, you know, the date is not in the right range, right? So we don't care about multiple errors. We just care about the first one, which stops our processing. So that's the second, uh, second model. Uh, Golang uses the second model. Um, and in, in Haskell, you can do either of those models. So because Golang is using the second one, we will kind of compare how to do it in Golang and how to do it in Haskell using the second model, right? And then you have the, the third model, which is uh, we want to validate all the errors and then be able to communicate to the user that you know um, multiple things are wrong, right? So for example, we have some JSON form from the web page, and then we're asking a user for, um, I don't know, name, an age and uh, email address, then if they gave us the name, which is wrong, uh, and the age, which is out of range, and the email address, which is which doesn't look like an email address, then we give them all three errors. We say, you know, your data has all those errors, fix all of them, and then uh, maybe it will work, right? Uh, with the B model, we're saying, well, the first thing is wrong, right? So then we have uh, two auxiliary um, mechanisms. So th this is all error handling and you can do error handling um, through exceptions or through errors or through other mechanisms. And we will kind of explore that. So we will explore it a little bit today with Golang and with Haskell. Uh, later we will explore it with uh, Rust as well. Um, and you can, deal with errors um, using certain mechanisms which most programming languages have and those two mechanisms are exceptions so all, all abc are kind of about errors you know abstractly speaking but then there is kind of a specific uh, way of handling errors and that is to use exceptions or panics um, so some of the modern uh, programming languages they have this concept of exception and um, they also have a concept of panics, right? So in ex with exceptions, um, can you tell me um, example of programming languages with exceptions? So what programming languages do you know uh, that have exceptions? So programming languages with exceptions. So use the chat uh, and, and give me some, some, yeah, perfect. So we have Java, Python, C++. Others? 
Okay, so programming languages without exceptions. So what programming languages don't have exceptions? Okay, so um, do you have exceptions in C? Not really, right? You, your program will crash if you do something really wrong, but you don't really have exceptions. Uh, and then another language which doesn't have exceptions is Go, right? Go doesn't really have exceptions neither. Those are kind of a two programming languages that don't have exceptions. Uh, there is, most languages have exceptions, including Haskell. Um, Haskell has exceptions, and interestingly enough, it's a library thing. Uh, it's not kind of a language construct. It's a, you know, you, you, if you want exceptions, you can just, you know, say import library, which has exceptions, and then I can have exceptions. I can throw and I can catch. Uh, but, you know, it's not the language feature in itself, uh, which is very interesting uh, if you think about it. Another interesting thing is Java has two types of exceptions. They have um, checked exceptions and runtime exceptions, right? So runtime exceptions are kind of like panics. Um, they, um, if you don't do anything with them, they will crash your program, uh, but you don't have to do anything with them. The checked exceptions, uh, you have to be checking them, right? So you have to control of who throws what, and if you call it, you have to be kind of a controlling what happens with those exceptions. So there is a lot of extra code that goes in and most people don't do that, right? So most people will kind of go with runtime exceptions and they sort of use them sort of like panics, right? Um, in Go, you kind of don't really have exceptions, but you do have panics and you can kind of catch panics. So you can handle um, you know, panics if you want to. You should not, though, right? So you should um, do not use panics for or to pretend pretend they are like exceptions. Um, so why Go doesn't have exceptions? Uh, the designers of the language, they thought it's harmful to have exceptions, uh, that exceptions are not a mechanism that really makes the software quality better. It's something that makes the software quality worse. Okay. So if we, it, it is, you know, it may, you may think of it that as a bit controversial. Um, so let's see. Um, did I close all the things? Yeah, I don't need that. That was Christopher course. All right, so let's go and uh, ask Wikipedia. Wikipedia, we asking for uh, error handling. Uh, exception handling, maybe. Exception handling, yes. So if you kind of uh, go to criticism, you will see that exceptions are from about 1980s. Um, uh, Tony Hoare kind of um, really criticized Ada at the time. So, you know, the, the hot uh, flavor of the month in, uh, you know, 80s was Ada. Uh, and, and, and he said um, that uh, Ada has a plethora of features and notational conventions that some of them are very unnecessary, right? Like exception handling. So he pointed out that Ada has exceptions and he said, this is very dangerous. Uh, please don't write any, you know, um, 
software that will send rocket rockets to to the space or be controlling uh, you know nuclear warheads or hospitals using this language because you know having exceptions is like a super dangerous thing to have in software and then there is a lot of studies uh which suggest that for example um like that that's the citation is here it says you know um millions of java code was tested and then uh, they've analyzed some of the projects which were using Java, and they found a large number of exception handling defects, such that you know, that, you know, because you have exceptions and because you're mishandling it, you're making your software very unreliable and very uh, misbehaving, right? Um, so um, go, um, you know, go doesn't initially didn't have this recovery thing right uh so it like they, they decided to that it's a wrong thing to have exceptions such that um you should um not kind of rely on the exception handling as such so we do have in go we have this panic recover that's what i said um that's what i said here uh that in go you have panics uh, but you should not use panics to pretend that they are exceptions. You should really use them as panics and don't kind of, op, you know, um, um, use it for that. Um, exactly. So, you know, um, in Go, uh, when you have unrecoverable uh, error, you should panic and you should not catch it, right? So you should not use recover. Uh, you could, but you should not. So your software should be designed in such a way that all recoverable things are done through errors and all unrecoverable things are done through panics. And that's basically what Rust will tell you later as well. So we will go into Rust later and we will sort of discuss it, but it's kind of the same. Uh, so languages with panics. So yeah, um, with panics. So, you know, Java, but kind of runtime exceptions. Uh, they are not really panics, but they are kind of like panics. Um, then you have Go, and then you have Rust, and potentially others, right? So th there are some languages which have panics. Um, and I mean, you know, th this is like an explicit way of panicking, uh, of, of crashing the program, because you have implicit uh, panics in all programming languages, right? So all programming languages, if something goes so bad that it's unrecoverable, the program will crash, right? It's just that you don't have the sort of a panic semantics. Uh, it, it, it is built in into a runtime system. So implicit. So with implicit panics, yeah, Java, uh, Go, Rust, and, and so on. Uh, and you have Haskell as well. So you can panic in Haskell. Um, Okay, so those those uh, two, we will spend a little bit more time later on. Uh, we are today focusing on B. So we saying, okay, uh, we will handle errors. We will handle user input through validation and we'll propagate errors with that mechanism, okay? And to achieve that, uh, so we focusing on B, focusing on user errors, and for that, we're doing a very simple, primitive, uh, like trivial uh, model where we have a student. The student will have name, surname, and age. And we have some constraints on what those can be. Uh, so we say that the name has to start with a capital letter. Uh, it cannot have digits inside. Uh, it has to have at least two characters. And then surname is the same as name, but we make a restriction of four characters instead of just two, right? So there are small, small difference. And then age needs to be a natural number between 18 and 130, right? So we don't expect from a user any um, other number that a natural number between 18 and 130. So we have like um, five conditions and we have kind of a three fields that we need to validate. And we want the program. Um, so if I go to my uh, students program in, um, in Go, uh, the program looks like this. So you start it and then you have some commands. One command is end, which ends the program, right? So, okay, that works. Another, pro another command is new. And new 
expects uh, parameters which allow you to create a student. And then if I call it without any parameters, it should tell me what, er what is an error, right? And it, the error says, um, you should provide three arguments, name, surname, and age, right? Okay, so let's try again. So if I say A, um, somebody called A, surname A, zero, zero, uh, uh, zero, SH, then it has three arguments, but it will not create a student, right? So it says, okay, invalid name. You see, um, we're doing model B, which says, okay, uh, name is invalid, but so is surname and so is an age, right? But we only get information about the first error and the first error is about the name. Um, all right, let's fix that. So let's say a new invalid name. It doesn't say what it should be. Well, maybe I should uh, provide a more meaningful error messages here. Uh, but I, I know from the spec that it has to start with the capital letter, right? Um, and then it has to be at least two characters. Okay, so if we try that, it will say, yeah, name is now fine. Our surname is wrong. Okay, so let's do right name, right surname, and wrong um, age. It says age should be between 18 and 130, right? So, so far, so good. So if I say new Joe Biden, I don't know how old is he, 65. Um, I will have a new student and then I have another command, which is list and I can list all the students um, and uh, listing all the students uh, lists me all my failed attempts, which is wrong. That's a bug and lists me a student that um, fulfilled the um, fulfilled their criteria. So that works, okay? So let's go to the go uh, and let's fix the bug first. So uh, if I have if I have an error new student, I should not add it to the database, right? Um, so here I have a bug which says, even if I have an error, I'm still adding the student to the database. I should not, right? So. I will say else add the new student to the database. All right, so by fixing this bug, let's redo it. So go build students. Again, I will say new, uh, whatever. And then I will have some new mistakes. So whatever age is wrong. So I have two wrong attempts and one correct and I listed and I, I have just him, right? So that's great. So that works if I add a new uh, Alice, I don't know something and she's 21 and I list it, it works, right? I have my listing of the students and it works. So then I have exactly the same implementation in Rust. So if I say, ah, oh, not in Rust, in Haskell. I don't have it in Rust yet. In Rust, you will do it. Um, so I have it in, in, um, in Haskell. So let's kind of clear it such that I don't have text. All right, and then if I um, say new, the same thing, uh, it works, and if I say new something that has a wrong age, it says, yeah, age has to be between 18 and so on. And if I do list, it kind of works the same. You will notice that the formatting of the, of the students is slightly different. Um, I am using the default of the language, right? So I didn't implement it how a student needs to be formatted. It's done by the language itself. So let's have a look at the implementation. So let's start with, with Golang. Um, we have some imports. Yeah, we have to have some imports. Uh, we're defining a student. So our student is name, surname, and age. And it, it is kind of a struct. Um, and that's the most natural way to model the domain, right? So we have some sort of a data with some fields. Uh, and in Golang, you know, that's the, you know, uh, de facto way of doing it. Um, you have to think if this struct is only used within this package 
or whether you want to export it. So you will use the capital letters uh, or small letters, depending whether you want to be exporting it or not. So I'm kind of, um, I am exporting the type. You see, I am exporting a student, but I'm not exporting the fields because I don't want whoever is using my module to be messing up with the internals of that struct. But I want them to see that there is a student type such that they can do something with it, right? Uh, but they should not see the fields. So I, I hidden the fields such that they don't have access to the individual fields uh, outside my package. Um, usually that's a good strategy because you don't want like, for example, once I validated the name, I don't want anybody else from outside to be messing up with my name and putting it unvalidated string, right? So I don't have a student which has illegal name or surname or age inside, right? So to, to do that, um, I have um, create student. So we will get to create student at the end, which gives me the student and it gives me a validated student, right? With legal name, surname and age, same as per the specification. Okay, so then the second thing I have is a student DB, which is an interface to my database such that I can read and uh, write into the storage, into this uh, student storage. And in Golang, I need to initialize it. So I have to have some sort of mechanism to initialize it. And then I have, because we only have two functions, we have new, which creates a new student and we have list, which lists the students. I only need two functions, right? I need add, I could call it new student uh, or should call this command add maybe uh, for consistency. Uh, and then I have get lists all students, which gives me all the students currently in the storage, right? And it is an interface because I want to be abstract enough such that I can call those things on top of whatever backend I have. I can start with a memory database, like I am doing it here by modeling it by a simple slice, or in the future, I can redo it uh, to ask a Firebase or uh, a local database and my API will be the same. So I will not need to change my program and it will kind of stay the same as it is here, right? So for the purpose of this exercise, I don't need persistence. So I'm doing, you know, I'm doing a very simple uh, model with um, modeling the data as a slice, right? Uh, and then I have my initialization function which uh, creates a new uh, storage for me. So it creates an empty slice of students with, uh, with value zero. And then I have a function which returns all the students from my storage. And in my case, because it's just a slice, I'm returning the, the slice itself, right? So up to this point, um, there is no real magic. Uh, it's, it's all very simple and all very kind of intuitive, I, I would say, right? Um, all right, any questions about this? Okay, so let's compare the, this sequence to Haskell now, right? So we kind of, what we achieved here, we've modeled our data structures, we've modeled our storage, and we've implemented the behavior of the storage within our domain, right? We, we haven't touched the validations yet, uh, yeah, so we have th those because we can add a student, we can retrieve all the students, we store them, and we have the types, right? So how does that look in Haskell? Um, in Haskell, it looks very similar. Um, so I have, um, as I told you last time, I, I will not use, so here I'm using string for name and surname and int for an H, right? Uh, in Haskell, because I don't pay any performance penalty and I, I want my methods to be more descriptive, I am not using, um, um, I am not using primitive types, which are strings. I'm using kind of a more elaborate ones. So um, I kind of remapped aliases to string to name, surname, and then alias to int as an H. And then I have basically the same as I have with, um, as I have with Golang, that I have some sort of a record which has name, surname, and H, and uh, of, of uh, appropriate types, right? And because those types are just aliases, uh, then 
you know, it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's just kind of a convenience and, and self-documenting feature, right? Um, however, I have here uh, deriving. I don't have it in, in, in here, right? So one already one thing to notice is that uh, with Haskell, I specify and I control what does it mean to compare two students and what does it mean to print a student, right? I'm using equality and I'm using show to derive the default implementations of how students are compared. Like if, I, if I'm comparing one student instance with another, uh, the default equality comparison will compare the fields. And if all the fields are the same, it will say, yeah, this student and this student are the same, right? Uh, and show, basically, you, you kind of seen it here, the behavior of show is like this, right? Uh, in Golang, I kind of don't have it explicitly. Uh, I, I don't have it explicitly here, but uh, there is a built-in equality between the students, and there is a built-in uh, printing of the struct as text, which you've seen here, right? So the default behavior is already in Golang as well, but I cannot, I, I, I'm not choosing it to have it. It's kind of there always, right? If in, in Haskell, if I choose not to, if I don't say this, then I cannot compare students because they are not comparable and I cannot show them because they're not showable. They are not printable, right? I can delete this line and prevent two students to be compared. I cannot say, is this student equal to this one? The compiler will say, you cannot compare students. I cannot prevent that in, in Golang, right? So here you already see it's a little bit more powerful because first of all, I control what I want. And second of all, I can prevent this to be the, 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 um, the case. Whereas here I can't. Um, okay, but you know, no, no big deal. I mean, you can modify the way students are compared um, and by adding extra uh, functions, and you can modify how the, the two string works on students by kind of implementing student as a, um, you know, a kind of a stringified uh, stringer kind of instance, such that it prints itself slightly differently than this, right? So you do have some control, uh, but here it's a little bit more powerful. All right, so then I have this uh, database uh, type uh, and I have my database type in Haskell as well. And, you know, it, it is more trivial in Haskell because I just say, yeah, I, I just have a list of students. And here I have to have um, this extra struct and I have to have this extra in it, right? So those two lines, those, uh, I don't know, six lines of code a kind of one line in Haskell like this. Uh, I achieve exactly the same behavior. I have an abstract type, which I can do things with. Um, and I kind of have it def by default initialized because you cannot have uninitialized nil things uh, in Haskell, whereas you can in, in Golang such that I need to call this make uh, here, right? Again, no, no big deal. And then I have, um, I have add student uh, method which um, adds a new student to the database, right? So add student in the <clears throat> in Golang is here, and I am appending a new uh, new student to to my slice. So I'm kind of um, in Golang we attach stuff at the end, right? Uh, because it, that's how append works and that's how Golang works. That's more efficient way of do, doing this. And in Haskell, we prepend the new student at the top of our list because that's how Haskell works and that's what's simpler, right? And again, those, you know, this line of code is basically this, right? Um, because I have a concatenation operator and it kind of does the same as append. No, no problem. I don't need a listing, right? So in here, I have the uh, get all students method, which extracts all the students for me from the, from the storage. Uh, but here, I, because this type is an alias to this type, I don't need to have this method at all uh, because it, it is basically the same thing, right? So I don't have list of students because if I, if I have instance of this, 
I basically have an instance of the list already, right? So I, I don't need it. If I modify the student DB to be a real database, I would have to have kind of a handle to the database and have this get all students with the handle. But because I'm doing it in memory, I don't need it. All right, so that's that's good so far. So let's have a look at the validation um, validation code. So in in Golang, we validate the name and then we say, okay, given a particular name, which is a string. So remember here, every time I'm saying new, um, I'm providing string one, string string two and string three, right? I will create a student from three strings and I have to make sure that those strings are correct. So my validation always works on, on strings and then produces the particular type that needs that it needs to be. So in the case of name and surname, it's a string, but in the context of age, it is the it is kind of an, an integer, right? It's a number or age. Okay, so here we um, we compare, like let's have a look at the spec. So what was the spec? So what should the name be? So the name must uh, start with the capital letter, uh, cannot contain digits, and um, should have at least two characters, right? So I have, um, so I'm validating the name and I'm saying, is the first character, uh, is the first character the same as the capital of that character? So is the first character capitalized? And if it isn't, or if the length is less than two, or I, I should also have the condition that prevents um, prevents the digits, right? So I would say, um, I would need to say, or, and then I would need to check uh, if all the characters uh, in the, um, in the name are not digits, right? So how could I do that in Golang? I would need to write a bit more code, so I didn't do it, right? Um, I would have to go through character by character and check if each of the characters is um, um, a uh, non-digit, right? Or is a proper alphanumerical character, right? So here uh, at extra three lines of code, uh, three to four lines, maybe, uh, for a for loop um, with going over all the characters, right? So this code will be a little bit bigger because I need those three to four extra lines. And then if there is an error, if, if the condition doesn't match, I, I'm kind of uh, saying, you know, invalid name. I'm not saying what, uh, what it is. Maybe I should say, uh, for example, expected uh, first cup, minimum um, two characters and you know um, and so on but uh, I didn't do it um, it's in the spec uh, you should I should do it here um, all right so then with the surname is the same as with the name but the length must be four and again I'm not checking for those digits because it's a bit cumbersome so I didn't do it I was too lazy and then with the age uh, I'm doing conversion from a string to an H, and then I'm catching an error if that conversion didn't work. And if that error, I mean, if I, I've got a non-empty error, I'm returning it and I'm returning kind of minus one as value, right? So I'm returning the, the H and the error, but if there was an error, the H doesn't matter because the error matters. And then if the H is between, um, is not between 18 and 130, I say it should be between uh, 18 and 130. And then I'm returning nil error, error if I pass the validation and the new age uh, if, if it is correct, right? Um, so in Haskell, it looks exactly the same again. So let's have a look. Um, so I am modeling because I don't care about multiple errors. I only care about one error. I'm modeling the error situation by the left side of either. Um, and then I should not return a string. I should return a name. Uh, but 
that's a small glitch. Um, so then if I'm if I pass an empty thing to um, to validate name, I, I say, okay, I got an empty name, so you can't have the name. Uh, and then, so that's an error left. And then if I if I'm if I'm passing it the um, if I'm passing it um, a proper uh, proper name, I'm checking if the first character. Um, so the first character is T. I'm checking if it is uppercase, and then I'm checking if the length is bigger than one because two is a legal name, but anything less than two is not. And I'm not I'm not also checking for the for the digits, right? So we have one condition which neither Golang or Haskell check, uh, and it is kind of like uh, the the check is the, oops, the check is this one line, uh, and then for surname is the same. I'm checking for um, let's let's double check. So here I'm checking for error, so less than four, and here I'm checking for positive thing. So I'm as asking, is it more than three, right? Uh, and the, the same thing. So uh, if everything is correct, I'm returning right without an error. And if something is wrong, I'm returning left, which is an error. So if you compare those uh, three va uh, validation sequences with those three validation sequences, uh, they are almost identical. They, you know, uh, Haskell is a little bit more compact, maybe uh, slightly more um, concise uh, because I usually just can squeeze things in one or two lines, uh, all the tests, but no no big deal. I mean, it's, they are comparable, right? So there is no huge difference between this code and this code. Um, all right, so then I need a command processor. Uh, so I need a processor which will take those commands and if, uh, if it recognizes it, it will do some things. And then if it doesn't recognize, um, yeah, it needs to recompile. So let's let me clear that. So I will tell you, I will show you one extra thing. So let's clear that and let's call it. All right. So one one extra thing is that if I type some rubbish uh, in both, uh, I expect the processor to say that it doesn't recognize the command, right? So I'm kind of not. I'm, I'm recognizing that that's an unrecognized command. But if I press just enter, I want the behavior like, okay, you know, I, I can keep pressing enter and nothing happens, right? And then if I uh, do some rubbish, I, I have unknown command. And then if I knew, if I add Alice, um, Alice Frank 21, new Bob crazy 12, 12 is not gonna work because age needs to be so new, Bob, um, I don't know, chatty, 34. Then I have two, two guys. And then if I do the same here, um, Bob, chatty, 34 list, then I have two, two guys here, right? So the behavior is exactly the same. The printing is slightly different. As I said, I'm using the default Printing behavior of the of the language and then handling of the errors, you, you're gonna catch the first error, right? So the handle, the processor is basically um, it needs to read, um, it needs to read line by line, uh, split the input line into words, and then depending what the first word was, do something. So if the first word is an empty line, if nothing happens, then I kind of quit, right? Um, I, I quit the loop uh, to the next iteration. Uh, if the case is new, I'm creating a new student from the second parameter onwards, right? So if I see those three things, I, I disregard the first token and I pass it to create student, the rest, like um, a slice of uh, those three strings, right? Uh, and then if I have an error, I print the error. If I don't have an error, I add the student. And then with list, I get all the students and I print them. And then with end, I, I quit. Um, and then if I don't match any of those, I print an unknown command, right? Again, no magic here. Uh, it's pretty straightforward and pretty easy. 
And then if you compare it to, to, the, to this code, it's kind of exactly the same again, right? So um, this command takes a database such that it can add those new students to the database uh, when I call new uh, and it adds them to the, to the database. Uh, it's the same here. So I have kind of uh, uh, this command accepts database, but there is a small difference, right? So this code is impure because it modifies the student database and it mutates what this what it is, right? Uh, in Haskell, I cannot do that. So I cannot mutate what student DB is. So I have to return a new version of the student DB such that, you know, um, I have the updated version of the database such that I can use it in subsequent calls, right? right? So here again, I'm kind of reading a line. So it's a, kind of an equivalent of this, uh, of those lines of code. Um, I'm getting a line. Uh, if the line is empty, I, re, you know, recursively call myself again with the, with the database, the original database, because it didn't change. Uh, and then if I have a new, I create a student with the, um, with the, slice or the list of words which are be you know without the head without the first one and then uh when i call it i can have an error and if i have an error i print the error and i call it back with the old database but if there was no error i add the student and i call it with the new student so you you see um the the those two implementations are kind of almost exactly the same uh, the error handling is almost exactly the same. Um, the only difference here is that I'm kind of not recursively calling myself here. And the reason is that in Go, uh, if you go to Go and go to main, um, you, um, yeah, so in Go, I kind of don't recursively call myself because I have this for loop. And this for loop iterates every um, every new line. It kind of calls. It's like you know, I, I have an iteration effectively, right? I don't have loops in Haskell. So to simulate a loop in Haskell, I have to kind of call myself, right? So I'm simulating for loop with recursion instead of having a for loop, right? So the mechanics are kind of slightly different. Like I, I have a for loop here, and I have kind of a recursive calls. Uh, in here to simulate the, the, the for loop. But ap apart from that, those two commands, the, 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 the two functions are almost, again, identical. All right, so now we're getting to the, to the meat of the lecture, okay? And the meat of the lecture is the final, uh, final uh, function. So the final function, let's start with Haskell first, okay? So the final function in Haskell, which is create a student. So create a student takes this slice or list of strings and it has to give me a student or an error, right? Um, so what, how does it look like? Well, I'm checking if I got enough arguments. If I didn't got enough arguments, I, I, th there is an error because I cannot construct the student, right? So if I call it, with less, um, if I if I call it with only two two parameters, I didn't got enough parameters to construct the student, right? So that's the first line. I'm checking: did I got three arguments? If not, I have an error. Otherwise, I'm constructing a student from validated name, surname, and age, and the validated name, validated surname, and age are basically I'm calling my validation functions with the deconstructed uh so here i'm kind of deconstruct deconstructing the name uh, the the list so the list has three arguments because if it if it isn't the first pattern would catch it so i i, I know the list has three elements and i map the first element to n the second to s and the, uh, the third one to a and i'm validating this name surname and h using those validation functions and then i'm constructing it so this line is logically simple and I'm doing here only what I need to do and the error handling just happens by magic, right? Um, so let's compare it to Golang. And Golang create students is 
substantially longer than this one. Again, I'm, I'm kind of stressing here that it's a very trivial functionality. I only have three fields which have very simple things. And uh, you know the logic is like as simple as you can get, like hello world type simple. Um, so I have to validate name, I have to validate surname, and I have to validate age. But the clarity of the code here and the clarity of the code here is kind of different. Like here, I have to deal with errors explicitly, right? I have to check if I got the error. And then if I got an error, I have to deal with it. If I got an error, I have to deal with it. If I got an error, I have to deal with it. And then I have to deal with the non-error path. So I have two paths. I have kind of paths with errors, and then I have a path without an error. And in Golang and in like, you know, C++, you would have to do that. Like you have to deal with those different paths um, yourself, but it is kind of a pattern. Like you, you can see that this is a pattern, which is very typical that you have kind of a, a normal line, which has no errors. And then you have kind of a, a, a line which, which has errors and then you need to deal with it, right? And then some language in some languages, you can abstract this logic, this kind of uh, this pattern away and let the language deal with it. Uh, in some languages, you cannot abstract it away. And in C++, you could abstract it away using uh, metaprogramming and using generics. And you would kind of achieve something like, like in Haskell. Uh, in Rust, you also have a little bit of ability to do that, uh, but in Golang, you don't. So Golang, I, I know, you know, I love Golang. I, I, I have nothing against Golang, it's just that uh, different languages have different way of dealing with abstractions. And in some languages, this ability to deal with abstraction is much simpler uh, and much more powerful than in some other languages, right? And the language that you know, the syntax that you know, restricts your thinking. Because in Golang, like if you only knew Golang, you, you would code things like this your whole life and it would feel to you it's fine but it, it is not fine, it, it smells. It, it kind of, uh, all these repetitions here, this is a code smell. Like it, it, it should not be here. Like, look, I have exactly the same behavior. I have the, exactly the same logic. And I, although I don't have this smell here, right? It's clean. It's very clean code. Um, and the behavior is exactly the same. So how come I can have this clarity and this kind of conciseness without this kind of a code smell uh, in one language and not in the other. Well, that's how the languages work, right? So, and we kind of don't care uh, about the languages. We care about like structuring our problem in such a way that it's easy to think about it and it's easy to deal with it. And then the language kind of um, is only used for um, expressing it, right? So I, I cannot stress it enough, but um, Let's go back to the readme file. So um, uh, let's say concluding remarks, concluding remarks. So for most people, for most people who program, um, the flow goes like this. Uh, there is a language that they love. Let's say they love Python uh, or I don't know, uh, Java. And then they think, in Python or in Java to solve the problem. Uh, and then they code it, all right? Uh, so that's the sequence. But the, the language, whatever, whatever the language is, uh, it can be anything here, right? Uh, whatever the language is, it restricts your thinking. And that's a big mistake. Um, that's, that should not happen. Um, so, you should not do this this way. Uh, so what you should do is you should turn thinking up, right? So you think in abstract. And what I mean by abstract, you have kind of a workshop, you have some tools in your thinking that are independent of the programming languages. And this toolbox helps you to solve problems. And this kind of, um, from your abstractions toolbox, right? Uh, so using um, uh, using tools and using concepts uh, from your abstraction toolbox. 
And this toolbox is something that is in your head, right? Uh, and then code it in a given language, right? Um, because this model kind of helps you to deal with complexity. Uh, it allows you to deal with much more complex things than if you think in the constraints of the language, right? Uh, so for example, it would never occur uh, to a Go programmer that this pattern can be extracted away, right? It, it, I mean, maybe in Golang 2.0, they will extract that pattern away and give you a language features that can tidy this up, tidy this smell up. Uh, but um, there is much, you know, much more powerful way of thinking about it if you think about it in terms of applicative validation, right? And this applicative validation is exactly what we did here. Uh, and it's, you know, you know, this, this line of code is quite beautiful. It's quite nice. It's quite concise. And it hides all the complexity of dealing with errors behind it, okay? And the most important thing is, if we go back to the spec, so let's go back to the spec and say now, okay, um, dealing with one error is fine, but what if I say new uh, and I have a name problem, I have a surname problem and I have an age problem. If when I press enter, I want all three problems. I want to say, I want the program to tell me you have an invalid name, invalid surname and invalid age fix all three problems, right? Um, so how would I need to do, what I need would need to do in Golang to have this ability, right? So now think about it. What would you need to change in Goal uh, to handle this new requirement? Like, okay, you have a working system. It works uh, and works in Goal. Um, we just you know tested, tested it and it works fine, but there is a new requirement. So the new requirement is catch all errors. So what we, what we would need to change? Well, let's have a look. So when I, when I do this mess here, right? I would need to say, okay, uh, I'm not returning the error. I need to have a mechanism now to um, collect all the errors, right? So I need to, to have some sort of um, a collection of errors. Uh, let's say it's, a, it's an empty slice. So I have error, right? Zero. So I have kind of a collection of errors. And now after each validation, instead of returning it, I would need to um, say, OK, um, I got an error, so I will my collection of errors equal uh, equals append um, uh, collection of errors and the new error, right? Uh, and then I'm kind of not returning it yet. I will return the collection of errors here. So I will say, okay, I want to return the collection of errors um, instead of a single error. And I have to modify all those things. Like, so I have to modify uh, here, here, um, and here, and here. And then what if, for example, I have, so I have new a, a zero. And now um, the, the problem with name is that it's, too short and it doesn't have a capital character as a first. So it also has two errors, right? Okay, so I have to modify here, 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 here. And then I have to go here to validations. And when I'm doing the validations, I have to split the single if into multiple ifs. And for each of the error, I have to, again, instead of returning an error, I have to return a list of errors and so on, right? So. In effect, I have to modify uh, those, three, those three functions uh, to accommodate this kind of a change of behavior. And I have to um, modify my um, create student function quite heavily here, right? Okay, so how that would be in Haskell? Uh, okay, in Haskell, this 
and Haskell, this would be not touched. I would not touch it um, almost at all. The only thing I need to change is, okay, I'm returning uh, a list of errors. So here I have to say, I'm returning, you know, I, I want something like this, right? I want this to be my, my change that I have to do. Um, however, you remember that either, like if I have this kind of applicative composition of either's, right? So um, here I have an either name or an error. Here I have either surname of an, or an error. And here I have either um, age of an error. And then this applicative composition of either's doesn't work with maps, it works with picking the first error and propagating it through the chain, right? So whatever error I had here will be reused for here and for here, right? So I don't have the uh, composition of errors. I have the um, propagation of the first error. So I cannot use either. So if I change it to this, it would still give me only the first error, right? I need to modify this to a type which will do what I want. And the, the type that does what I kind of accumulates the, uh, the, uh, the left-hand sides. So like, you know, this potentially has a left side and a right side, and this potentially has a left and right side. But if this one has left and this one has left, I want the left side to be this appended to this. I want both, right? I want to concatenate the, the left sides. And uh, there is a type which is called validation. Um, which does exactly the same. So it kind of works um, almost like um, uh, like either, but it the behavior of, of accumulation of left sides has a slightly different semantics. So instead of having just the first value being propagated through the chain, it appends all the left sides together, right? Um, so I, yeah, so I need to, in, Port. So I need to import data validation. Uh, and then um, this will work. And because now I'm using validation for name, surname, and age, I have to modify. So th that's the only change I need to do in this code. Uh, and then in here, I have to change my uh, behavior. So instead of using either, I have to say validation. Uh, and then I say, okay, I have a, a collection of errors instead of just one. And I can uh, say validation string or name. And here I have a surname. And here I have H, yeah, so. All right, so now I can, uh, oh, come on. I have uh, did all the modifications that I need. I need to change because uh, validation, if you Google it. So let's say, Google. Data validation. Yeah, so val data. Where is it? Data validation. So I have failure and success instead of left and right, right? So I have a slightly different um, uh, vocabulary to where is the other window? Okay. So instead of saying left, I, I have to say failure. And then um, I spell it wrong. Failure, yeah. So that should work. Oh yeah, so failure expects me to give it a, um, 
a list of errors. And then if the thing is correct, I'm returning success. And then if I had, um, again, I can return a list of successes. No, I uh, success is just a name. And then uh, in else close, I have failure, which returns this. So you get kind of the point. I do need to do modify the code as well. I mean, I need to modify those three functions. And because I want to catch like, okay, uh, different, like if I couldn't um, like for these ones, like if it's uh, too short, there is a different error. And if it's uh, not capital, uh, that's a different error. So I can return for failures, I can return, uh, return multiple things, right? And then once you do this change here, then this code is almost uh, not changed, right? So yes, I have a failure here. Uh, and then um, fail, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 right. So then uh, it will, work and because i'm printing the um i'm printing the errors so every time i have the validation error for create a new student so if i get the left side i'm kind of printing it um haskell will kind of print the list as well and golang will print the list too so if you collected it into a slice and try to print the slice it will sort of uh print it in a re reasonable way as well all right, so that's um, uh, you have is asking if you could uh, use um, a recursion in Golang implementation for the for this scanner. Uh, you couldn't because you have to maintain the state of this scanning here, right? So you you need to loop through the scanner scan function such that you get the new line. Right, so that is a kind of um, a bit of a catch. You could if you pass the scanner to the command, but it would complicate the code, right? So yes, you could turn this code into recursion, but you would have to pass to the exact command also the scanner such that it kind of knows what the current uh, scan is. Uh, and it would make the code less, it would make the code more ugly, right? So the use of for loops in Golang is more idiomatic and it's a little bit easier and nicer than using recursion in, in, in Haskell. Um, all right, so I will put the code into the repository such that you can play with it. I will modify the, uh, I will finish modifying the, uh, this code to be dealing with case C, uh, but I will not change the, the Golang code to case C because it's too much uh, typing, right? I would need to do too much work to do that. So I will leave it with case B, but you have an idea of how this could be turned into case C, right? Um, and we're gonna redo it again in, in Rust. So in a couple of weeks, once you know Rust, uh, we're gonna redo exactly the same thing in Rust and then again, compare what are the advantages. So Rust is kind of in the middle. So Rust is not as powerful and, and as Haskell, uh, but it's more powerful than, than Go. And this code in Rust looks a bit nicer. Uh, then we, you, you know, we can kind of come back to this discussion a little bit. So uh, Ricard is asking if you wrote the entire Haskell program with validation, would you get the same initial functionality of only printing the first error by only using the last element for error? Yes, you could. So you could uh, write the, you could basically write case C and only use one of the like uh, head of your of your list, right? Um, I don't. I don't actually remember if validation appends them uh, on the right hand side or left hand side. I, I think it appends it from the. Um, so the last errors, like the last error, will be on top. So Ricard is is right. If I want to print the first error, I would use the basically the last element. Uh, I'm gonna test it. But, you know, in which order the appends happens. Like if we're doing this uh, applicative composition here. Um, 
but yes, you're right. You you basically is it's more powerful to just use validation, and then if you only want the first error, you can just use one from the list, right? Yeah, you're right. Okay, so um, we will uh, finish here, and we will start talking a little bit on Rust on um, on Tuesday next week. But if I manage to record, uh, th th there is a new assignment coming up. So the new assignment is about a small programming language that we will do. Um, and I need to introduce a little bit extra things. And if I manage to record the lecture before next Tuesday, I will post it and it will be in a form of recording. And then we will jump straight into Rust. But if I don't manage to record it on the weekend, then we will spend Tuesday talking a little bit about that in using Haskell. So we have one more topic in Haskell to, to wrap up. Um, uh, and it is about like uh, how to write this uh, kind of a small interpreter. We've done, we've done the calculator, uh, but I, I need to extend the calculator a little bit more such that we can do this uh, small exercise for assignment two. Um, and then we will kind of dive more into uh, into Rust, but of course we, we will be comparing things to Haskell throughout the rest of the semester as well. So we not uh, completely dropping Haskell, but you will have an extra thing now to think about, which is Rust syntax, right? So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions, then post it on the issue tracker. And I will see you guys physically Tuesday on campus. Yeah, bye-bye.